silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, brown young virgin, mother and child, holy infant so tender and mild, sleep in heavenly peace, sleep in heavenly peace, silent night, holy night, shepherds quake at the sight, glorious streams from heaven above. Heavenly hosts sing hallelujah. Christ the Savior is born. Christ the Savior is born. Silent night, holy night, Son of God, Love's pure light, radiant beams from thy holy face. With the dawn of redeeming grace, Jesus, Lord, at thy birth, Jesus, Lord, at thy birth. I'd like you to take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter 6. I had an unusual week. Uh, I was uh, spent about eight hours in preparation for the sermon that I was planning on preaching. And uh, after I'd gotten all my uh, sermon notes finished and I was... Uh, taking a bath, getting ready, uh, the Lord spoke to my heart and he said, I don't want you preaching what you've prepared. And just as though he didn't speak to me audibly, but in my heart he told me my text. And I said, okay, Lord, I'm going to preach what you want me to preach. Hebrews chapter 6 is a very controversial chapter. A lot of people uh, are afraid to teach this chapter. And uh, there's a lot of confusion. And I want to try and eliminate some of that confusion. Uh, Hebrews chapter 6, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you now in the name of the Lord Jesus. We thank you, Father, for your grace and mercy. I know, Lord, that I'm a sinner saved by grace. And, Father, I know without you I'm nobody. I'm, I'm lost and undone, but with Christ I'm redeemed. And, Lord, you've called me to be your servant. And I pray, Lord, you'd help me now to share the message. There be one here in our midst who's not saved. Oh, how I pray today you'd open their heart. One of my dreams, Lord is to have all my family to get up and sing together, my son-in-laws, my daughter-in-law, all my grandchildren, my children, to sing for the glory of God. And I just pray, Lord, that you'll bless all of our people here today, be with their families, their children and grandchildren. Father, I pray for the United States of America. Oh, God, have mercy upon our country. Lord, we've sinned and we've shed innocent blood. And if you were to judge us, Lord, it would be righteous judgment. And I pray, Father, that you might send revival and people's hearts would be turned to the Lord. I thank you for saving my soul in 1978, turning my life around, giving me hope and faith I thank you, Father, for all that you've done. We pray for those that are sick in our midst that you'd touch them. 
Father, we know that healing may not come overnight or in a month or even a year or ten years. But you've promised us, Lord, that you'll never, ever put more on us than we can bear. But we, you will, with the temptation, provide a way of escape that we might be able to bear it. So, oh, Father, I just pray for Brother Miller's back problem as he goes to the doctor to see about the surgery or what they're going to do. I just pray you'd touch him and heal him that he wouldn't have to go through this surgery. I pray, O oh Lord, for Jamie Coomer that you'd touch her, Lord, and heal her. And Father, I just pray for all the ones Brother Chapman mentioned in our prayer request. And Father, just pray for each person here today. Be with uh, Brother Nolan's family as many of them are sick and I pray you'd be with uh, Sister Wilson and bless her and help her feel better, Lord. And uh, just pray for Kelly and her family. And uh, Lord, we pray for uh, all the people gathered together that have needs on their heart. Help me, Lord, to be a blessing as I'm your servant to share your word. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Hebrews chapter 6. Now, the book of Hebrews is most likely written by the Apostle Paul. Whether he penned the words or transcribed the words, I believe the Apostle Paul is the author. Some say that because of Paul's eye problems, he had Barnabas or one of the other apostles, uh, one of the other disciples, to write down the words. Uh, but none of us really know. But we know it's inspired by God, and that is the critical issue. So he begins in chapter 6, and he says, Therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Now the word doctrine, didakos, uh, meaning teachings, doctrines, doctrine is like skeleton. If a church don't have doctrine, it don't have a skeleton. It, it will not stand. It will fall for anything. What would your body be like without a skeleton? It'd have, you'd have no control. The same is true of the Lord's churches. And our doctrine is the Bible, the Word of God. It's what tells us what to believe and what we should do. Now he says, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Now you've already heard that there is one gospel, how Christ died, how he was buried, and how he was raised from the dead the third day according to the scriptures. He ascended to the Father, and he's coming again. That's the gospel in a nutshell. The gospel is the only way for sinners to be saved. Now, if, if babies die before they come to the age of accountability, I believe they go to heaven because they have not sinned uh, and therefore the, the atonement of Christ, the death of Christ will pay for their sin because they do not understand. However, if you understand sin and you understand the Word of God to any degree, you know that the Bible teaches that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He's not a way. And let me, let me share something with you. When Jesus says in John chapter 14, when he said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life, in all those three cases, it is used with a definite article. That definite article is the. When, when the Bible says Christ is the way, that's the definite article that means there is no other way but His way. Now you can be a Buddhist, you can be a Muslim. Last night Kathy and I talked with a couple that one was a Buddhist, one was a Hindu, and they had the Lord had saved them. And we were talking about how they came out of Hinduism and Buddhism and believed the gospel and were saved. And uh, it, it confirmed over and over again to us that Christ is the only way to have eternal life. You cannot go any other way. 
Not by works, not by baptism, but only through Christ. Baptism does not wash away your sins. That is a heresy taught by different false churches. Gospel of Christ is God's way. Now he says, leaving that, if you're grounded in that, let us go on to perfection. Now that word perfection literally means perfection, to attain a condition that is as near to perfection as is possible. Now it doesn't mean that we're sinless. We all sin because the Bible says in John chapter 1, if we say we have no sin, we lie and do not the truth. But we are to strive to attain a complete, perfect life as much as is possible. Now he goes on and says, not laying again, notice the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. They had already gone through that they had repented of their sins and their life of deadness to a life in Christ. And now they were new creatures in Christ. And then he says, from dead works and of faith toward God. Remember when Jesus began to preach, he preached repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. He goes on and says of the doctrine of baptisms. Now, there were different Jewish customs where they would use cleansing rituals uh, to uh, cleanse or purify in ceremonies. Paul is saying that even those Jewish people that had used that were putting all of that behind us. Doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands. Remember, they laid hands a couple times. They laid hands when they ordained a young man into the ministry. And they laid hands uh, on people that were sick. And they prayed for them and laid hands on them. And God worked in His miraculous way. I've had a lot of people pray for me. And uh, all of them would put their hands on my back or my body where I was hurting and they'd pray for me. You may notice sometimes some of you all will go out of the church and you'll tell me, Brother Tony, I'm hurting. And you may not even realize what I'm doing, but I'll put my hand on your shoulder or somewhere near and I'll pray for you. You don't know it, but I'm praying that God would touch you. The Bible tells us here and of resurrection of the dead. We know that the resurrection is going to occur at the last day. The trump of God will sound. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The resurrection. You see, the first resurrection is when you get saved. When you're dead in trespasses and sins, for by grace are you saved, like our sign says. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, what is it? It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If we could be saved by works, we'd go around boasting our heads off. Oh, I did this and I did that, and that got me saved. No, your works do not get you to heaven. You go to heaven by grace. The Bible tells us then, he says, verse 3, and this will we do, but let me point out one other thing, and of eternal judgment. Eternal judgment is to come. A lot of people want to deny the judgment, but the judgment is coming. That's right. We'll all be judged. Now, whether you're saved or whether you're lost, you're going to stand before God. Do you know that? Every one of us. What have you done with your life? You say you're a Christian. You say you love God. Well, what does the evidence say? If somebody followed you every day of your life and watched what you did and then they reached a conclusion about what you were, would they say the evidence shows that person is a Christian? Are they in church? Are they in Sunday school? 
Do they put the Lord first or do they put their desires first? I remember when I got saved, the devil kept telling me, well, you'll have to quit baseball and basketball and softball and football. You won't be able to do all those things you do during the week. And I said, that's okay, Lord. I want my life to be counting for you. So Monday night, I was at church visitation. I started teaching Sunday school within three months of being saved. I wanted to serve God. I started going to the jail, the nursing homes, and I would share the gospel with people. I had a burning desire in my life. I didn't just want to be a mediocre Christian. I wanted my life to count for God so that when I die, I can hear Him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Now, I did that not because of me, but because he worked in me and he caused that desire in my heart. I, wanna, I, want, I don't want my Lord to be ashamed of me. I don't want him to be ashamed of my unfaithfulness. And the Bible says, this will we do if God permit. Notice always, whenever you talk about doing something, always remember, if the Lord will. Now they got this old saying, if the creek don't rise, the Lord will and the creek don't rise. The creek don't rise is not in the Bible. That's an excuse. I've seen people wade the creek when they wanted to do something. Oh, but when it's church time, oh, the creek's up. We can't go. But see something else going on, uh, some kind of dance or a party, and they'll cross the creek even if they have to wade it. What do we do? If the Lord wills, we shall do this. But don't use the will of God as an excuse for our own laziness. And then he says, now I want you to look at verse 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. Now I want you to think about that soberly. It is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. It is impossible. They were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. They were enlightened. They tasted. That word tasted doesn't mean just to put a little in. It means to fill up your mouth and when you chew, you taste the flavor of your food. Your mouth is full of Christ. Your heart has been full of His love that comes from your lips. Notice, if you fall away, if you turn away from Him and live like that, what does it say? You, verse 5, you've tasted the good Word of God and the powers of the world to come. Now look at verse 6. If they shall fall away. Falling away. This word falling away is a word that means to turn aside from, to overlook, some translations translate it to stumble. You know, there are a lot of folks that start out serving God. They get hurt. They get offended for some reason. And in the parable of the sower, the one that lets the things of this world uh, offend them and they turn away from the truth, they bear no fruit. So he says, they've tasted the good word of God, the powers of the world to come. If they shall fall away, fall away from what? From dead works uh, that they have repented of. If they have, according to Hebrews 6, verse 18, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Amen. 
If you turn away from that, notice what it says. If they shall fall away to renew them again under repentance. Notice. Seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh. It's happening now. It's not three-day-old bread. It's how you're living now. Are you walking with Him? Is He in your heart and life? Do you love Him? Do you delight in Him? He says, If they shall fall away to renew them again under repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God. How do you crucify to yourself the Son of God? By turning away from the truth. By living selfishly. Well, I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to serve God when it's convenient. Not making a sacrifice. What, is, what does a Marine do when he goes into the military? He's dedicated. At one time, I was ready to join the Marines. And I talked to the recruiter about what they demanded of me and what I would have to do. And I, I said, I'm just not ready to do that. A big commitment they make. Well, do you know when you become a Christian, you make one of the biggest commitments that you'll ever make in your whole life. It's compared even to your marriage. When you make a vow to your mate that I will stay with you until death do us part. I will love you. It doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter what changes. My love and my commitment is unchanging because of His grace. Kathy and I have been married over 40 years. And I'm more, more committed today to love my wife and be with her until my death than I've ever been before. I'm more committed to being a father and a grandfather to my children, my grandchildren, and to love them and point them to the Lord because that's the most important thing in your lives. It's not how much money you have. It's not the fame and fortune you have. But what is going to be your account in heaven? What are you laying up? Not on this earth, but up in heaven. Are we sharing Christ? Are we trying to reach people that are lost and undone? Or are we too ashamed? Too afraid? Last night, my wife and I got on an elevator. A little man was sitting there. I asked him what his name is. He said, I'm John. I said, John, do you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior? He said, I don't know much of nothing. I said, John, he loves you. He gave his life and he died. And he rose from the dead to save you. And he kind of looked at me and just dropped his head. And in my heart, I prayed, Lord, please save that man. Please open his heart. He's, he's, he has no hope. He said, I don't know nothing. And I could see in his eyes the loneliness and the hopelessness. There's a world of people like that all around us. And if you fall away to renew you again under repentance seeing that you crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and you put Him, notice this, this makes me, this breaks my heart and puts Him to an open shame by the way we live, by the life that we show, by the dedication we have. I only had one mother, one dad. And as long as my mother and dad was alive, they were a priority in my life. I used to drive all the way from our home to Boonville two or three times a week to check on my mom, to try and take care of her, 
to try and help her, my dad. And no matter what had happened in our past, I loved them and thank God that I had parents who let me live. Parents never know what their, their parents sacrificed and did for them until they become parents themselves. And they see the love and the dedication. And if anybody in the world is going to tell you the truth, it's going to be your parents. Because they love you with a love that just cannot be measured. So he says in verse 7, For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh out, cometh off upon it, and bringeth forth herbs, meat for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which heareth beareth thorns and briars is rejected. What are we bearing? What kind of fruit do you have? You say you're a Christian? Where's your fruit? If I walk by you, what can I pluck from you? Is there love? Is there kindness? Is there grace? Is there forgiveness? Is there encouragement? There ought to be. If there's no fruit, there's no life. What do you do when you have a fruit tree that does not produce? You may try to fertilize it. You may try to revive it for a little bit. But eventually, you just take a chainsaw or an axe and you cut it down. That's exactly what the Lord says about those who bear no fruit. Bearing fruit. And he says... In verse 8, But that which bear thorns and briars are rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. You're talking about, this is talking about hell. This is talking about being burned. Brothers and sisters, hell is just as real as heaven. Amen. The Bible talks more about hell than about heaven. Do you know that? Do you know there's nearly twice as many references to hell in the Bible as there are to heaven? But a lot of people don't want to hear that. Hell's real. What would you do one moment in hell? What if God were to just let us go one minute in hell? The wrath and the atmosphere and the darkness and the weeping and gnashing of teeth would be so unbelievable that we would just, oh God, how could I be in this awful place? How could I have been so neglectful to not know Christ and to end up for all eternity in a burning lake of fire? God says it's true, and it's true. Oh, if, if I wasn't saved today, I would fall down and pray, Oh, God, have mercy upon my soul. Save me, Lord. Deliver me from my own flesh. Notice verse 9. But beloved... We are persuaded better things of you. Oh yes, we, we see that God is going to do better things in your life. You're not going to be like those that wither on the vine. You're going to produce fruit. You are, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation. You know, there's a lot of things that accompany salvation. You turn to Ephesians 6, Galatians 6, and you see that the Bible talks about the fruits of the Spirit, joy. Let me ask you, are you joyful? Are you really? When you get up in the morning, are you joyful? Oh, I feel awful in the morning. Oh, until I get my coffee, I'm a wreck. Is that the way we are? When our eyes open, we should be thankful that we're alive. In the last month, 
when I open up my eyes, the first thing that I think about, oh God, you delivered me from that hurting, chronic pain that I lived in for 25 years. I feel just like Job. I feel like God has given me twice as much as I was deprived of for all those years. And I'm so thankful to God that He made a way. Wouldn't have been something I would ever dream. But He made a way to touch my body and to heal me. We're persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak for... God is not unrighteous to forget your work and showed toward his name and labor of love which ye have shown toward his name in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. That's what our lives all about, ministering to each other. How can I help you? How can I serve you? I'm not an overlord. I'm just a servant. Sinners saved by grace. My heart's desire. People call me up and they'll say, Pastor, I don't mean to bother you. And I say, look, you're not bothering me. I consider it an honor to talk to you and, and to be a blessing to you. It's not trouble. It's a joy. That's what we're here for, isn't it? And the greatest joy that we have in our life is when we're able to minister and love and encourage and point people to Christ. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. That you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherited the promise I think about John Huss when I was reading through this and I refreshed my memory of John Huss John Huss was a man that was determined to get the word of God to every farmer and he translated the Bible from Latin into English and because he did that he was public enemy number one You've heard by now, I'm sure, that Elon Musk has become enemy number one to the liberals because of what he's done on Twitter, posting uh, the true story of Hunter Biden and the president. Well, I want to tell you something. John Huss was enemy number one in his day. And you know why? Because he said, I'm going to put this Bible into the hands of the plowman and the plowman will know the Bible better than the clergy. And of course he was talking about Catholicism. And because of his love for the truth, they burn him at the stake. And when he was at the stake and they were uh, persecuting him, this man said some of the most incredible words. Words like, I'm, I only regret that I have one life to give for my Savior. And today, had it not been for men like John Huss, this would be in Latin. And the only way you could read it would be if you were trained in Latin. But you can open your Bible in English and you can read it. Thank God for men like that. Let's stand together. Brother Chapman, Kathy.